This is the only way to get to where the Australians are based in southern Afghanistan. Last year I travelled here by road, but the four hour drive from Kandahar is now too dangerous to risk. The NATO base in Tarankot is effectively cut off from the outside world. Two thousand Dutch troops share this huge fortified base with about 370 Australians. All equipment and personnel are moved in by air. It's a massive operation, replicated throughout southern Afghanistan as NATO forces struggle to maintain a presence. We're actually set well for 2007. We've had some pretty tough times and I don't think anyone should um, try to avoid that. Um, I think when we arrived here, the situation in the south, which is where most of the trouble has been, was probably worse than we realised. And as a result, there was a lot more fighting than we had to do. There was uh, less opportunity for reconstruction development. Australia's contribution is set to double later this year and I've obtained permission to spend a couple of days watching the ADF at work. Last year, Australian Special Forces and Commandos in Tarankot were replaced by engineers and infantry. Their new strategy emphasises reconstruction, but it's backed up with overwhelming firepower. Today, on our way to a local village, we have about 20 armoured vehicles and a Predator drone, an unmanned reconnaissance plane overhead. On the outskirts of the village, we stop and wait, while soldiers cautiously spread out and advance on foot. What we're doing is we're just setting up the security posture down in the, uh, in the village that we're about to commence work on. And once that security is uh, established, we'll then move those engineer stores down and, uh, and commence work. It's a less aggressive um, posture for the locals and it's a, certainly much easier for dismounted troops to, uh, to establish security on the ground uh, outside of their vehicles. What we're doing is we're putting in, uh, we've got three guys put in a tank. I'd rather put the tank down there, yeah. Once the security perimeter is established, the engineers can get to work. We're here to fit a water tank to the village mosque. It's part of a strategy to win the local people's support away from the Taliban. Because of all the precautions, the engineers feel safe enough to get on with the job. From oh, my point of view, it's just uh, just getting used to working with the with the gear on, obviously all the Kevlar and um, and that sort of thing. Uh, I've never uh, been worried about the security side of things at all. And obviously these these villages are cleared cleared by infantry patrols before we come in, and uh, we've got no drama. Yeah, yeah. I've never never had any incident. So you just get on with your job. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We only got only got ourselves to worry about here, which is a good thing. Any soldier has to be aware, not just of going in there and fighting the enemy. That is not what it's about. Violence, using force, is a means to an end. And the means and the end is the hearts and minds of the people. If the people support you, then you will win. But I was soon to learn that there's an inherent tension between fighting the Taliban and winning hearts and minds. Meanwhile, the Australian soldiers have seen someone suspicious. Get him behind you. That's him up there. Which one? Nothing straight through. Weapon five barrel. Yeah, what in green, green robes? Yeah, I just stood up and then sat down. Okay, from here, just grab your camera. I'll take a photo. From here? Yeah. Just to get the overall perspective of which uh, house is in. The soldiers have spotted someone using a mobile phone. Which one? This is him here. This is him here. They want to make sure he's not passing on information to the Taliban. That's not him, no, that's not the one that... Is it? That's him up there. Yeah, he's sitting down at the top there. Okay. Right there. Well, phones everywhere here now. Yeah. Yeah. Like in front of us, like over there. 
Alright, Carlo. Okay, Charlie 2, Morton to start with Adam, then Roger yeah. talking on one of my phones. Charlie 1 on me. Okay, Mike. That all the swag of Can you have everyone except him leave? Move yeah. away? That's all right. 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 That's the man says he's a policeman, but he is from Chora, a district that has fallen to the Taliban many times. There is no way to tell if he is the enemy. This strategy of fighting and development was introduced to the South last year by this man, NATO's British commander, General David Richards. In January, I was invited to travel to Kandahar with Richards, who controls NATO's 35,000 strong force. He's going to meet with his commanders in the South, and it will be his last visit before his posting here ends. Over the past year, the troops under Richards have suffered from some of the heaviest fighting since the invasion in 2001. Richards has spent much of his time calling for more troops to cope with the resurgent Taliban. But um, th there was a little debate, just to put it to bed, whether or not the extra US forces would be under, come under me. Well, that's been clear that they, they will, yeah. so don't worry about that. The only bits that but Richards were... knew that along with extra troops, he needed to win the support of the local population. Right, they're going to attack, you know. <coughs> uh, the fact he is... said the fight with the Taliban was bogging down foreign forces, and he recommended negotiation and development as a way out. Then you see certain nations, so you can't do that. Yeah, which... So, we, but we can massage it. Yeah, I think so. I think we've got a pretty good plan. Which yeah. are... No, I'm, I'm very happy with that approach. I mean, you know, um, we, we... it was an approach that angered the Americans, but Richards is convinced that it's worked. I'm absolutely certain it's been a success. Um, first of all, you can compare it what might with what might have been. And I take you back to last summer when we deployed into some of these tough areas for the first time. And that just stirred up a lot of narco warriors as well as some Taliban that were there. Um, but the um, Taliban at that time said they would defeat NATO. They were going to kick the British out of Helmand. Uh, subsequently, they were going to mount a winter offensive. Well, there hasn't been a bomb let off in um, Kabul uh, for four months that succeeded, you know, and so on and so forth. Self-evidently, the Taliban actually have failed to achieve their stated objectives. So we've set the conditions for success. I am not saying we have won, but we've set the conditions for success. And that, given the relative paucity of troops, which are now being addressed, which is fantastic news, um, I think is a huge uh, plus for NATO and prove that we could do these things. Despite Richard's upbeat assessment, almost 200 foreign troops were killed in Afghanistan last year. Today, he's meeting a high-level delegation from Canada, which has suffered 44 casualties in the recent fighting. I watched um, Canadian soldiers and leaders last summer through the most difficult part of the operation uh, come on through for NATO, for Canada, and I think I'm a bit soft on this for the whole free world including many fine Islamic states, of course, which we need to remember. The problem for commanders in the South is that because of the high risk, most NATO countries refuse to send their troops there. I think we'll hear news from one or two other nations about reinforcements. And it's not because we are worried about the Taliban spring offensive. It's because we believe we've established the conditions over the last year uh, against some people's expectations, um, which will work as a really good launching pad for further success in 2007. Success last year 
meant 4,000 dead civilians and Taliban. Back in the south, the Australian soldiers have moved to another village. The atmosphere here is tense and the soldiers have formed a tight cordon around us. The engineers decide to dump the furniture they've built at the mosque and leave. No one is prepared to say why we're pulling out, but for the moment, security clearly trumps reconstruction. Did you feel that um, there was more threat, there was a higher threat level there than the, at the first one? Uh, we did find some weapons, uh, but all in all, we have to work with a gut feeling in the end. Uh, we don't always see the threat, and uh, the threat may or may not be there. So uh, we go in hard and we just uh, always um, always plan and always work for uh, the worst case scenario and that way usually works. We drive to a defensive mountain position a few kilometres away and set up camp for the long cold night. The men take it in turns to watch the surrounding hills for Taliban. As we saw yesterday with these Australian soldiers working in those two villages in Uruzgan, they're working in a very high risk environment. They're working to gain the trust of the population, but it's the same population that they can't afford to trust themselves. Like the wider NATO mission in the whole of the South, this is going to take a long time, it's going to take a lot of resources, and it's not a conflict that's going to be won on the battlefield. Realising this last year, NATO Commander General Richards negotiated a controversial ceasefire with the Taliban in a town called Musakala. One US NATO general reportedly said that if Richards was American, he would be sacked. First of all, I should say uh, I'm uh, attributed with many things, one of which is that I uh, dreamt up that deal. Uh, it's the sort of thing I thought we should be doing, because there's a lot of good Taliban out there, as well as some we can't do anything with except fight, I'm afraid. Uh, where are we today? Well, there's been no fighting in the, the five kilometre radius that's uh, covered by this deal for about four months now. That means the schools are back working again, children being educated, the bazaars open, the mosque is being rebuilt, all things that couldn't have happened. We just want to remember that. Uh, in other words, people aren't still dying there, including British soldiers. Just days after my interview with General Richards, he handed his command to an American general, and his ceasefire was in tatters. The Taliban retook the town of Musakala, and NATO airstrikes then killed the local Taliban commander. Many civilians fled. The Americans had accused Richards of allowing the Taliban to regroup, and now they felt vindicated. It now looks like NATO's new American commander will revive the more aggressive approach that previously turned people back to the Taliban. Dateline filmed these American Marines at work in the South three years ago. And there was no sign of an attempt to win over hearts and minds. In the South today, the Australians' approach is very different. They've brought pencils and colouring books for the local children. This is just a small token, it's a, a new turban, a new headdress for him. And they hope to keep the village elder on side by giving him a turban or longi. Hopefully, um, hopefully he likes it and it's suitable and it's just a small gift between the Australians and the Marines. As the soldiers learn, even a simple gift can have a double meaning. Most people they think like we're Taliban, like Taliban also wear like this kind of turban, you know. 
The hard work of sorting friend from enemy continues. Then, on the road outside the village, soldiers spot someone familiar. It's the man they searched yesterday, the one with a gun who claimed to be a police officer. They're alert, but not especially alarmed. The only suspicious blokes I'd say were the ones from yesterday. They were the ones who had the gun <laughs> yesterday, was that right? Say again? Was that the one who has the, had the gun yesterday? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he didn't. When we actually asked him if he had weapons, he didn't tell us until we'd done the search and we found that 9mm on him. But, uh, yeah. yeah, and apparently he's a cop, but don't, he, he didn't have any idea, nothing. He's not a fully qualified cop. Yeah. Yeah, but he still had a weapon, so he was the only bloke that we've seen today and a few of his offsiders that were with him yesterday. Right now, it's pretty, yeah, pretty same old, same old. I've been in this area before. The soldiers admit that their enemies are sophisticated. They can't see them, but the Australians know that the Taliban are tracking their movements. Pretty high level of spotting activity around here, yeah. um, but we never really observe it, so they must be pretty concealed, yeah. well concealed, or just in, uh, places where too far away for us to actually observe them. Yeah. Um, so they're basically spotting to try and find them. So yeah, there's there's talk, there's been talk, sorry, there's been talk that uh, there are like medium value individuals around this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but basically vibe, no, no, there's no bad vibe. Children are all running around, there's women and yeah, elders yeah. Are running around, you know, so seems pretty secure. The Australians are doing their job in this small corner of southern Afghanistan, but they are only 370 out of 35,000 NATO troops. And there are huge problems with security throughout the country, even in the capital, Kabul. Previously safe, Kabul was rocked by more than 50 suicide bombs last year. At one stage, UN workers refused to go to the main UN office for fear of attacks. You cannot expect people to have confidence in institutions in the state if the state's not delivering. Now, in 2007, uh, will we be able to rapidly turn around and deliver those things? Um, probably not immediately. Do you think the there is the political will in the international community for that to happen, for that long-term commitment? Whether there is or not, there needs to be. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, uh, Afghanistan needs to work. It can work still. But it is not just a question of more troops. Afghan politicians from the south, such as Nasima Aliazi, say that the behaviour of soldiers has been part of the problem. Australia plans to double its troop deployment this year. But the extra soldiers won't be engineers. They're special forces, whose job is to kill, not reconstruct. The international forces will have more men, but whether they'll be fighting or rebuilding is up to their commanders and, of course, the Taliban. <laughs>